Uh, yeah, thank you so much, um, James, for allowing Saffron to take over <laughs> um, and bring this amazing panel together. Um, I'm Olivia Pinnock. I'm a fashion writer and a lecturer in fashion marketing and journalism. Um, and I also run a series of events here in London called The Fashion Debates, um, which uh, discuss all sorts of issues of ethics and sustainability uh, in the fashion industry, because um, it's kind of a bigger problem than many people really realize. Um, so, but I'm very excited to be joined by this fantastic panel um, who are going to shine some positivity <laughs> um, on this uh, sticky situation. Um, so I'm going to kind of run this in three parts. Um, the first part I'm going to call a cautionary tale from the fashion industry and what happens when you don't value your craft. Um, and uh, then we're going to hand over and I'm going to ask a few questions to um, our panel here. Um, and then I'm going to open it up to questions from you guys, um, because it's great to be here in an audience. Um, I'm very used to talking to an audience who already knows something at least about the fashion industry, if not about sustainable fashion. Um, and so it's, I want to know what you guys think and what you want to know um, and think. So I'll, um, bear that in mind and um, save your questions, because I'll, I'll open it up. Um, so, to give you a bit of um, context uh, about things, let's take away the word fashion because it has some weird connotations for people. Um, and let's talk about clothing because we all wear clothing, right? I'm looking out there, you all managed to get dressed this morning. Well done, well done. Um, <laughs> that's a good, good start to things. Um, and really, because it's one of those uh, necessities. Uh, that, that we have as human beings. Um, it's actually a really, really ancient craft. A lot of the things that we recognize in the things we wear today have really, really deep histories. Um, the first pair of leather shoes date back to 3500 BC. Uh, India has been you know, world leaders in dyeing and producing colorful fabrics uh, since 2000 BC. Moving further on, amazing batik craft from Indonesia um, goes to 6th, 7th century about. Um, lace making from the 15th century. You know, we all kind of recognize these things um, today. But what, what's happened to those things and where are we now? Um, so not quite bringing it up to the present day, but obviously the Industrial Revolution um, was our first opportunity to uh, really bring in technology and make things at a faster pace, a more affordable pace. Um, and we started to see a, f a few of the issues that can come up then, um, as amazing as it was for um, our economy and technology and, and advancing us and things, we saw an awful lot of pollution. Um, we saw a lot of social issues in that what happens when you replace craftspeople um, with low-skilled workers who really, really need a job um, and the vulnerability that that, um, that puts them in when you treat people like machines um, and not like craftspeople. Um, and, uh, but that's not to say that a lot of our very like, highly skilled, um, you know, top level, think of our shoemakers in Northampton here in the UK, um, is still an amazing, they are world leaders, still are very well renowned for uh, their shoemaking. Um, and they kind of managed to, to struggle through that period and retain on top because of the, you know, the immense beauty of what they can really do, a craft that's been refined over centuries. Um, but then in the 1960s, we started to outsource our manufacturing to places like China. Um, and uh, that's when fashion craft really starts to take a big hit. Um, not because we're losing those craftspeople necessarily, although that, that does happen, um, but because it changed consumer behavior forever. China is able to offer a much um, cheaper option, uh, which is very appealing for brands and companies, um, and they start be, being able to make an awful lot more at a lot, lot cheaper price. Um, and that kind of lands us where we are today in a fast fashion landscape. It's why you can walk into Topshop or H&M or Zara or whatever uh, once a week and find something different in there. Um, because of all these, these uh, things that have happened. Um, where it also lends us uh, is that fashion is now the second most polluting industry on the planet after oil. 
uh, it means that we consume four times as many as much clothing as we did 20 years ago. It means we can't grow cotton at the rate that the uh, you know demand for it is. Um, it means that you have disasters like uh, the Rana Plaza factory collapse in Bangladesh in 2013, uh, where people, people knew that that factory was unsafe to go into, and yet they were told, if you don't turn up to work tomorrow, you lose your job. They turned up to work the next day, and a thousand people lost their lives when that factory collapsed, because fast fashion retailers needed to get their next drop shipment of clothing to sell more and more and more to us. We put, in the UK, we put two tons of clothing into landfill um, every single year. That's just the UK. Uh, what also happens is that even that clothing that we don't send to landfill, um, when we, we send it to a charity shop, which, you know, is a good thing that I would encourage, um, but there's so much of it going to charity shops that they're taking a lot of it to third world countries where the second-hand clothing market has saturated everything and meant that local artisans, local textile makers, um, and craftspeople uh, you know, are, are out of work, um, and those skills are kind of um, dying out. Um, so that's a bit depressing. <laughs> <laughs> and it's why I do, I do what I do. Um, to say that there is an alternative, and there are a lot of people, not a lot of people actually, there are a few people um, in, who work in sustainable fashion who kind of say like, we've got to go back, we've got to go back to that make, do, amend attitude, we've got to, uh, you know, stop, stop buying so much, and to a certain extent we do, we absolutely do, but at the same time we can't go backwards, going backwards is not the way forward, um, we've got to meet the world where it is now, we've got to meet consumers where they are now. We've got to find innovative, exciting options to kind of revive this craft and add value back um, into what our clothing is and what it means. Um, which is why um, this is the perfect opportune moment to introduce you to these three incredible brands um, who practice craft, um, who take kind of traditional practice, but also mix it with innovation um, and a forward-thinking attitude and the way that I hope the fashion industry is going for, for the future. Um, so uh, let's have a round of applause for Elvis and Cressy, Bottle Top and Black Horse Lane Ateliers. So why don't you start by, I'm going to let you do the introducing to your, to your brands and what you do. My name is Cressy. I'm the co-founder of Elvis and Cressy, and uh, I, for me, fashion is a weird term as well because it means uh, it's essentially ephemeral. It means something temporary, and I'm not interested in temporary things. Um, when I first came to the UK, uh, what I was interested in was garbage. So I went to the landfill sites. I went to the sewers, uh, rather than I suppose Buckingham Palace and the rest of those kinds of places, um, which are lovely too. But the sewer is. Outstanding. <laughs> and what I actually fell in love with, this is back in 2005, was London's decommissioned fire hoses. I, I have a thing for garbage. It's, it's, a, it's a lifelong uh, illness, I suppose. And I brought this beautiful fire hose home to my partner, Elvis, and I said, look, they're throwing away 10 tons of this stunning material every year, and it's, it's life-saving, and it's narrative-rich, and it's red and beautiful and we are going to solve this problem and he said hey I, you know I've got a job I'm fine <laughs> so I kept pestering him and we did a lot of research into what we could use this material for our goal wasn't to set up a fashion brand our goal was to create the best possible future for this material through a lot of trial and error and a lot of R&D we came across a document that showed us that Louis Vuitton in their monogram collection uses kind of a lesser quality nitrile rubber than makes up fire hose. And I really thought, you know, dead luggage maker, that's not going to be competition for me. <laughs> that's going to be easy. So we started making uh, belts because fire hose is long and straight and belts are long and straight. And that was the easiest thing that we could start to craft ourselves. And 12 years later, um, well, for the last decade, we have saved all of London's hoses from going to landfill. 
we donate 50% of the profits to the firefighters charity and we, we use waste in our entire business. There is nothing new in what we do except for the materials that we start with and the philosophy that if you're not giving back, there's really no point. Hello guys, I'm Oliver Wayman, um, co-founder of Bottle Top. So Bottle Top is a British um, ethical luxury brand and um, we've also been going in different guises um, since 2002. Um, the essence then and really now was um, to use sustainable materials in a design-led way. So really making sure that we, the product is first and obviously using making the, the supply chains and the production process as sustainable as possible whilst also alleviating poverty through the production of these products. So um, my business partner Cameron first found a bag in, um, in Africa in, in 2002 in, um, in Uganda to be precise. And um, through a collaboration with Mulberry, um, they used this bag made of bottle caps um, with a Congo leather lining, um, became the best selling bag for Mulberry that season. And um, it was really ahead of the game. I mean, in 2002, no one was really talking about sustainability and certainly not within fashion. So it was, um, it was quite a trailblazer and it kind of created a bit of a template for us to work off. Um, we started working in, within music. My background was in music and we were doing a record in, in Brazil. And whilst, um, whilst working on this Brazilian record, um, I came across a bag made from, um, or a production technique, I guess, to be honest, made using recycled ring pulls from cans, which had all been crocheted together, creating this whole new textile, which was, which was amazing. I mean, they were doing it in really sort of simple forms and little groups out there, but um, you could see the potential for this particular kind of material and how it could use to different uses. And um, we, we effectively, after um, lots of trial and error, developed our own atelier in one of the poorest favela communities in Salvador, northeast Brazil. And this was just through really meticulously training and working with um, some of the most disadvantaged women um, in the community and helping to provide them with um, transferable skill sets and uh, a solid, um, secure income to help themselves look after themselves and their, and their families. And um, as with Cressy, interestingly, we, we started with belts and within, you know, within a month they were able to make belts of the right kind of quality that we're after and within two months full on sort of um, handbags and um, we developed you know from from an initial kind of charity concept into a full-blown sort of fashion brand and launched the fashion brand about five years ago and since then we've done collaborations with some of the best designers in the world like Narciso Rodriguez, um, Donna Karen and we've got some some exciting so collabs on um, in you know in the pipeline, but what's really what's really been interesting is just being able to see how you know effectively using some of the most disadvantaged people, but providing them with the support, the skills, the right kind of level of training, and they were you know that and they are able to compete with some of the best artisans in the world in, in some of the best Italian and you know Spanish factories. So um, I'm very much of the um, mindset of telling people to to really believe in and to give people the right opportunities in these circumstances. Um, as well as that, probably a quick note, which is worth you knowing, we've, we've just launched the first um, store in the world made from 3D printed using recycled plastic. Um, that's just launched on Regent Street in mid-November. And um, it's, I think, another example of how you can use sustainable materials and reinterpret them in a whole new way, but still sticking to the, to the core values of the brand, um, the DNA, be it using, um, you know, in a design-led way and, um, and executing at the highest level possible. So I would um, urge you all to pay a visit to 84 Regent Street when you can. Thanks. <laughs> Uh, hi everyone, my name is David Giusti. Uh, I handle the digital business at a company called Black Horse Lane Ateliers. Um, these are our jeans, they're made in Walthamstow. Uh, we're the only jean maker in London for over 50 years. And we're trying to uh, start a craft jean revolution inspired by uh, craft brewing. Um, I spent about 11 years as a product manager working in different tech companies, spending my nice tech salary on, on clothes. Uh, and then I found out about a company in, in Walthamstow that was trying to rethink how you make jeans, how you, how you can make them better, how you can make them last longer, and, and ultimately how you can make people aware of where your clothes come from and who makes them. 
Um, generally speaking, you can't walk into a factory and uh, meet the person who sewed the shirt you're wearing or the jeans you're wearing or the shoes on your feet. Um, we're trying to challenge that by having an open door policy. We want people to walk into our atelier, talk to the people who sewed their jeans, see how they're made, share the secrets of how we make our own, and if we do this right, we believe that people's appreciation will grow for the clothing they wear in the same way that everyone in this room has had their appreciation of quality beer or quality coffee grow. We think that same thing can happen for fashion. Then, if we succeed at this, people will fight fast fashion. You know, they'll buy nice things that they hang on to, they create stories with, they fix them, they keep them going longer, and ultimately look after the planet. So. Um, to wrap that up, our values are about unmatched quality, so that make the best gene we can, um, eco-consciousness, making as many decisions as we can do to look after the planet, and connectivity, so working with other London brands to, uh, to help each other out. Thanks. Amazing. So um, I guess since we're at a tech conference, the obvious question seems to be, what role does tech play in your businesses? Um, you know, we, we both set up before even Twitter. Right. So, so I, uh, we set up our first website. We coded it on Dreamweaver because there was no Shopify. There was none of these kind of platforms. I think if, if, I, if I tell you 67% of our income comes from e-commerce, then you know how important tech is to our business. Mm -hmm. And I think it, what's, what's really becoming important now is that you know, we have developed a way to collect, uh, Firehose was our first love, but we've found a way how, of, of how to reclaim the world's leather waste. 800,000 tons of leather goes to landfill every year. Uh, we've created a system for reclaiming that, but the way for us to give the power of that reclamation to the consumer is through an app that we that is kind of crappy that's on my website right now. <laughs> and I'm only going to be able to solve that problem uh, much, much better if we improve our relationship with technology and make it more user-friendly because it, it, there is an interface there that is clunky and, and is getting between people and, for, in my view, the waste and creating this solution. So technology has to be at the core of our business because it's, it's our... You know, we are based in Kent, we have an open factory in the same way that you do, but less people will come to rural Kent than will come to Walthamstow. So our, our window really is our website, and we need that to be as seamless as possible. Yeah, I mean, tech has been intrinsic to, to what we've done without a question i mean it, it's 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 been instrumental in in developing the brand i mean we would we put a far high speed broadband connection into a favela community you know with the only only high speed broadband co uh, connection i think in a 5 mile radius and it was um you know we were able to have video skype conversations the minute that came out and being able to look at product quality control be able to have a consistent dialogue with with um you know the team out in brazil so that we could make sure that we could get to the root of the problems before the product shipped over so just purely on that level, they probably saved the business without a doubt. And we're consistently looking at new ways of being able to maintain better and you know more effective uh, interconnectivity and communication tools. Um, and obviously, as well as that, I think there's huge potentials now to within tech to look at new materials. You know, there's so much, so much development going on. I mean, I was at a, an event the other day, and I was looking at 3D printing with algae. Um, they're starting to look at using, you know, kind of natural materials for, um, and then starting to find different ways of being able to incorporate this. The more that this side develops, the less waste we're going to have. We're going to find more efficient production um, techniques and processes of being able to refine the whole supply chain. And then on top of that, which is a beautiful thing for uh, you know our, all of our businesses, is that we're, we're starting to really look at the supply chains now. And there are, there's more and more interesting tech, which is looking at um, you know the, the, the transparency within supply chains using, um, for instance, um, you know blockchain, which is transformational. So soon, you know, brands aren't going to be able to hide behind oh. We, we weren't sure, we didn't know where these materials came from, we didn't know how it was made, because the tools are in place and will be in place for the consumer to actually look at every stage of the production process. So, you know, tech is absolutely intrinsic and will be the most powerful tool to get us out of this mess we're in. Yeah, I think um, tech is definitely key to sort of day-to-day -day business. You know, I've worked in, in companies that have very high tech infrastructure, and then I went to work in a factory where they were still 
uh, on DSL until about three months ago. So you know, you'd want to have like a live uh, Instagram session and show people what we're doing inside the factory and I can't even stream video. Um, and so tech is, is key to explain what you're doing when it's something very physical. You know, our, our, our building that we're in, which is about the size of this space here, really is kind of the heart of Black Horse Lane. And you know, um, we're, we're selling jeans to Japan, to the US, to New Zealand, to, to Sweden. And if we can't convey the interesting thing that's happening in that room, then our brand's kind of for naught. Um, at the same time, I think tech is really scary and we have to be cautious with everything we do. Uh, I recently was at a sustainable fashion event and I learned about, um, I believe they're called micro polyfibers, which is basically when you wash sports equipment like Gore-Tex and these things, um, little teeny tiny microscopic particles of plastic get into the water supply and you know that, that gets into your body and has all kinds of unknown side effects. So I think there's this kind of double-edged sword of advancing technology and, and doing good things while at the same time uh, being careful we don't just create bigger problems that are going to go into landfills. Um, I know a lot of the idea of kind of interactive clothing I think is quite scary. Um, I know there's some research happening where someone's trying to, to be able to entirely dissolve a cotton garment back into uh, uh, viscose which can be reused infinitely and that's great but as soon as you put plastics into that same garment then you can't do that. So I think going back to natural materials, you know, cottons and leathers and hemp and uh, linens and things and looking at those materials kind of separate from tech is really key while at the same time seeing how technology can help us either correct or prevent future mistakes. Yeah, definitely. I think it's a lot about learning from the past and where we've been and, um, you know, and thinking through, like, you know, for the, those of you that were sitting in on the great talk about uh, ethics in computing yesterday, like actually thinking through that process and, and what it actually might mean and being aware of those consequences before they, they happen so we don't end up in a situation like we're in now. Um, how do you deal with your competition from fast fashion? Um, you know, you are small companies compared to those giants. I feel like those giants are learning from the sustainable fashion movement. Actually, you guys are teaching them um, the way forward. But um, how, how do you compete and how do you intend to grow your business when you are so craft focused? Uh, I guess I can start since I have the mic. Um, one thing we're trying to do is walking that delicate line of explaining why we believe we've made a better product using craft practices, while also being cognizant that um, sitting there preaching why your, your garment is made better or looks after the planet in a better way ultimately probably isn't going to have the same impact as a, a picture of a beautiful model in a beautiful garment in a beautiful place. So I think it's actually quite a challenge. You know, I, I could do a YouTube video where I show people the in, insides and outsides of our genes and why they're architecturally better. Um, but that's ultimately not going to get someone who's, you know, scrolling through Instagram excited in the same way that a guy in a really cool sports car wearing our jeans would do. Um, so I think you have to find this kind of balance of sh explaining your values and explaining why you're doing things different and why it matters, but also still finding the way to tap into those kind of primal things that make people excited about uh, something they, they see visually. Um, we think our secret sauce is actually getting people to walk into our building in Walthamstow. Um, the number of times someone's walked in, we've given them the factory tour, they've actually seen me shorten a pair of jeans for them or they've talked to one of the machinists who sewed them. They have these aha moments where they sort of get it. And I think, you know, if you walk into your, uh, your local brewery or coffee roaster, you have that same kind of aha moment about your, the beer or coffee you consume. So I think that's our, our advantage. I'm trying to always find ways to, to leverage that to, to fight, you know, uh, a pair of Uniqlo jeans or something like that. Yeah, I mean, um, it's, it's absolutely... I wouldn't even class us as fast fashion being a competitor. It's interesting, it's just such a different realm, you know, like being able to try to compete on price is just nonsensical because the, all of the practices, be it the materials being used, the labor practices being employed, um, why should you be, you know, fighting the bottom down to get to a level where quite frankly, you're gonna end up with pretty bad practices in place across the board. So I almost see fashion as being quite a two-pronged thing now. There's fast fashion, which is a world that 
we don't even we don't even try to deal with really i mean and i think a lot of um, ethical fashion companies or certainly smaller fashion companies have, have fallen by the wayside in trying to compete with that because we should never try and compete on price because we will never be able to but what we can do as as david was quite pointing out is quality attention to detail story you know brands with story with narrative where you can go in there for instance in the shop where we are and, and, and learn about the whole production process in you know in these disparate communities in in salvador learn about the the store being built in by robots in in east london you know it's this kind of thing which is really wows people and 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 almost um builds i think a community around the brand you know like actual advocates and people who are proud to wear the bags and say you know and become become brand ambassadors and then they tell their friends and then their friends are also you will start telling their friends and everyone becomes like a proud team effectively showcasing your products and that's what will win, I think, with our, within, our, within our game. It's like people creating a really um, kind of like-minded community of people who actually believe in who you are and what you do and where, you know, pricing doesn't play an impact, Definitely. basically. And, yeah. and social media is such an amazing tool for that. Oh, 100%, without a doubt. Social media and, you know, the more video content and, um, you know, if, um, documentary photography um, that you're able to use, um, you know, the, the better, quite frankly. And it, I think there's more and more um, yeah, realms and, um, and more uses, more, more mediums to be able to express that message and that really important story that all of us are trying to convey. So, mm. yeah. um, I, I agree with Oliver on a lot of things. We have uh, amazing brand ambassadors because a lot of people don't understand that there are 66,000 fire service personnel in the country and we've been giving them half of our profits for a decade. So that, that's, that's natural brand ambassadors for you. And it's not because, it's not bec even that's not because of social media. That's because we genuinely, truthfully, authentically give them money yeah. and support the amazing institutions that they go to when they've been burned in a fire or when their children don't want them to go to work because they're afraid of what happened at Grenfell Tower. Yeah. You know, it's, it, it's kind of, I think one of the things that we all have in common is that we're able to celebrate the truth of what we do. Yeah. We don't have to have a marketing story. Yeah. And I think it also comes to sort of what your ambition is. Um, you know, I, I'm not interested in having an empire, a, a fashion empire. I'm not interested in being Philip Green. I'm, I'm interested in changing the industry so that it has a future and that it's not a polluting one. And for us, actually, that's, that's meant a five-year partnership with, with Burberry, which we, we signed last year. And the reason we're in that partnership is that on my own, I can maybe, be, maybe solve the world's leather waste problem in 20 years. If I actually, truthfully, honestly want to solve it, I have to give my solution away. I have to be willing to share it yeah. with who I do perceive to be my competition. Um, I have to build a coalition of the willing. Open source. Yeah, right. Yeah. We, we, I, you know, I believe in sharing, so I've got to share the IP too. Yeah, I, yeah, I think that's, that's something that's so different between the sustainable fashion area and the traditional fashion area is that I find everybody who works in sustainable fashion, so they want to collaborate, they want to share ideas because they're all working towards the same goal. Having open factories like you guys do, rather than these like closed off, uh, you know, company secrets, um, you know, where rolls of fabric that are easily branded um, and stuff are, are slashed and damaged before they get thrown away because they're worried about their intellectual property. Um, like Maz was talking this morning about what they do at Unmade to like limit that waste, but um, it's, it's not that way for, for many of the world's fashion brands. And um, before I open up to questions for everyone else, I wanna throw um, a quote at you, um, and you can feel free to agree or disagree. This is from Sophie Thomas, who's a sustainable design expert. And she says, waste is a design flaw. Thoughts. <laughs> um, it is. So if we want to have a future at all in any industry, it has to be circular. And that means that everything that we make has to be designed to either be repaired for life, which you know is a philosophy that we live by, or it has to be designed for deconstruction so that the core elements can be reused and remade forever. And everything also has to be powered by renewable energy. So yes, this is quite utopian and out there. But it's the only way that we're going to have any future with things in it, is if we operate in a circular way. And that means that designers at every level have to consider, am I, am I making something that's making the world better for other people's grandchildren? It's like a black or white 
answer. And if you are not designing that thing, then you shouldn't be a designer. If we want to go a bit deeper as well, I would extend on that. And I think that it's, it's a product of the system we're in, right? In terms of you make stuff, but there's nothing to take into account the externalities that, you're, that are being produced. So we're going to consistently take this realm and take this kind of angle until we start to be forced really into thinking about well, what happens to the waste after? What happens to the waste during the production process? What happens to all these different things, which quite frankly, we don't need to think about. And, and I think brands will unfortunately continue to think this way, or the majority will, until, until they're forced into being like, no, you can't go for this cheaper alternative because of the impact that that will create, you know, in, environmentally on the longer, um, you know, in the longer term. Well, you can, but you're going to be taxed this much higher. So I think it's probably... Yeah, a combination of, of, of um, you know, company, I think mor morals within the company, I think education amongst the public, I think we all have a responsibility to think of a little bit more about that as well as we're, you know, through our consumption habits, but also through, um, through governmental pressure as well in terms of actually showing and helping, you know, the public to guide them to, to, towards um, which production methods and which materials are, should be pursued. So, um, so yeah, I wholeheartedly agree. So I definitely think there's something interesting with this idea of waste as a design flaw. I know when we make salvage jeans, you, you have the salvage line on the edge of the jeans that you have to optimize your pattern to, to include in, in your garment. And there's kind of like the middle of the roll of denim, which is less important. And so we found ways to kind of optimize placement of the pattern pieces on the roll of denim so we can get a bigger segment of fabric that's left over at the end. And so now we have this stack of maybe um, nine inch by 24 inch strips of denim, which we're now trying to figure out, can we make tote bags with those? Can we make um, aprons? So it's, it's all about, um, it, it is a, does, uh, waste is a design problem, but uh, um, I also think it's also, it's laziness in a sense. It's like, you know, every, if you get into the habit of questioning every action you take in terms of your impact to the environment, you can find some really easy, quick wins, some like low-hanging fruit, so to speak. Um, when we were kitting out our factory to do denim, uh, so it used to be a tailoring factory, we had to get a, a bunch of specialist sewing machines. And you know, all the big sewing machine makers in the UK were trying to sell us new machines. And our founder, Han, who uh, grew up in Turkey originally, went back to Istanbul, called up a couple buddies, and basically came back to the UK with all second-hand machines. So that's less metals, less petroleum, less plastics uh, used by our factory. Um, also, whenever we finish uh, production of a pair of jeans, we save all of our offcuts in trash bags and we donate them to local makers. <coughs> so we've had uh, a lady who has a very high-end fashion brand kind of using polygons, so to speak, of, of denim offcuts for to make really beautiful garments called the Autonomous Collections. Uh, we have a lady who took our denim offcuts and uh, weaves uh, hanging plant baskets which she sells locally in Walthamstow. Um, we have another lady who takes our denim offcuts and makes little small, I think they're called rompers, like the little onesies for, for your children um, to crawl around in. So we find kind of ways where we could put something in the trash, but because we choose to put a little bit extra effort, we, we put it in a trash bag and, and our trash is someone else's gold. Um, other things too around, around laziness and, and, and it being a design flaw and waste is um, that keeps coming to mind is, is when people buy um, acid wash or stone wash or kind of bleach jeans. Everyone kind of assumes that's cool and that's fashionable, but actually it's a mistake. Um, Cone Mills, which is the North American denim mill, uh, at one point, I think in the 70s, someone's built a bunch of bleach on their rolls of uh, raw denim, which looks very dark blue. And Levi said, oh, we might be able to sell this. And that kind of became the whole world of acid washed, faded, torn, ripped jeans. You know, that's that's a kind of a uh, a waste and environmental hazard that now has become a, a sales tool. And what people also don't think about is when you go buy those jeans that are bleached, torn, etc. someone in a factory did that for you. So there's people in third world countries who uh, use sandblasters to, to blast away the color from your jeans. Or they use, uh, they scrub your jeans with bleach and sandpaper. Or they tumble them in washing machines with a pumice stone that that plus the indigo dye all gets washed into rivers. Uh, there's a city in, I think, Guangzhou province in China where the, the river that runs through town is just completely blue because of all the indigo uh, and the waste from fading jeans. 
So by people not being educated about the environmental impacts of something like denim, they don't they don't challenge these these things. And um, you know, even the denim aficionado world loves Japanese denim. You know, it's it's the best in the world, so to speak. But what most people don't think about is that cotton source either in Texas where I grew up or Zimbabwe, it's shipped on a boat to Japan, it's milled into a roll of denim, and then it's shipped back to England. So uh, some of the fabrics we have in our factory have maybe traveled 25,000 kilometers door to door. Whereas um, when you say Turkish denim, people don't get excited by that. But some of the Turkish denims we have in our factory were grown in Turkey, milled in the same country, and then shipped to England. So it's about 2,500 kilometers, a tenth of the distance traveled. And so if you think of all the jet and boat uh, propulsion that's used to, to send that denim, you've had a, a, a small um, decrease to the environmental impact of, of, of denim. Uh, so there's all these little things almost every, under every stone you unturn and every corner you look in that can help you optimize and, and slowly decrease your impact to the environment. So from coders uh, and kind of computer scientist standpoint, you know, your low hanging fruit and your quick wins and your kind of uh, subtle refactoring and stuff of your code, um, if fashion can do the same thing, we can arguably decrease our, our, uh, our impacts to the environment slowly and, and, and steadily. That's really exciting. Um, does anybody from the audience have any questions? There's one over at the back there. Hi. Um, I think what you're doing is quite amazing. It's all actually about the supply side. My question is really about how do we also fix the demand? Fast fashion is basically increased the number of collections for a year to up to 32. It's absolutely crazy, and the whole message is about buy, buy, buy. I mean, off the street, was up to 32. How would you fix that? Um, we. Our, our attempt to do that is that we don't do seasons ever. We never have. We don't do fashion week. I don't intend to ever sell any one person more than one belt because it will last as long as your waist does. And even, even to the extent that we've had someone who, who put on a bit of weight and we made the belt longer. And then when he lost the weight, we made the belt shorter again. And that is the way that you change that, is by providing that level of customer service and by repairing for life and by designing so that things can be taken apart and, b and be made again with the same amount of care and the same amount of love. I can't, I can't uh, afford uh, Oxford Street rent. If I could, I would sort of buy the Primark and just stand there with my 20-year-old bag and never sell two belts. So I, that's why I can't afford those rents and I can't change it on that, that, that level on the street. But certainly by just behaving differently and offering people a completely different choice, we've managed to attract and retain unbelievable customer loyalty over the last 12 years. So I do think that it, it does take us time to grow in the way that we're doing, which is more about organic growth and more about delivering true value. But I can only be the best example that that I can imagine being, and for, for us, yeah, it's we don't do spring 2015, we, we don't do that. Yeah, I mean, what you've highlighted is effectively one of the biggest problems in, in fashion, and it's just, it's just getting worse. It's like a runaway train in terms of collections upon collections and inter-seasonal collections, trans-seasonal collections. I mean, it's, it's really difficult, and I absolutely commend um, Elvis and Cressy's ev uh, efforts in being able to stick and not play the game at all, and that's amazing if you can do that. We couldn't for various reasons. I think without being able to you know, <laughs> change the system entirely, I think we st we're still a functional business, right? So you still need to offer new product, you need to offer fluidity in collections for people to still be interested in what you're doing. But I think as long as you can maintain some yardsticks in place in which you're not gonna, you know, we're, we're two, two seasons a year, we'll offer, a, you know, a literally a two or three new colorways max, we'll try to stick to the same silhouette so that it becomes almost like a, a, a sprinkling of a, a, a new offer without necessarily changing the game you know the mainstay of our product will always be um, certain colors and styles that we'll always stick to and will always sell through you know um, not in sale so um, we're not unfortunately big enough to, to try to make enough of a statement and not do collections at all but I think it's having 
ethics and morals within your um, supply chain and within your, your actual marketing and product offering so that you know you're only going to offer two collections. It's not going to be a big change every time. Um, and then I think, you know, just trying to be as responsive as possible. And um, as with all these things, there's always going to be a, a negative to every positive, but I think you have to outweigh which is going to be the stronger one. So we've moved to a model which is far more responsive, where we do more regular shipments um, of products which are made um, quite, um, it's almost a bit of an impulse reaction depending on where we're finding demand is. That means that we can make more specific product and tailor it around the consumer's needs. What this also means, of course, is that we're having to ship more and we're having to air freight, which of course is damaging from the env environmental perspective. But we feel that that outweighs the fact that we're then able to make more consistent product and product that will be in demand and reduce our what's called terminal stock. You know, the stock that goes down, gets shoved into the cell and gets pushed and pushed and pushed on margins where until you end up, it ends up in TK Maxx for whatever 10% of the original price. So I think that the most important thing that brands need to think about, and fashion brands in particular, is this idea of being able to make as accurately as possible and cater for the demand, be as responsive as possible. And then we can get ourselves out of this problem of having to produce too much product, which is this ends up in all the wrong places. Yeah, I think um, a few things that come to mind is again, working outside of seasons, uh, you know, avoiding catwalks, uh, avoiding trade shows, avoiding wholesale as much as you can, you know, selling direct, just making what you need and um, kind of like just in time production. So I know, uh, more and more companies now are beginning to manufacture, uh, basically take pre-orders and only make that stock that the people want. Um, we have aspirations to do that ourselves, to kind of put a garment up, say, hey, who likes this? If so, what size would you want? And we only make that many. Um, that's one way. I think the next big area to focus on is around education. Um, you know, most people don't know that you can do what's called darning, where you basically re-sew a hole in a pair of jeans or, or in a bag. Um, so, for example, we offer free repairs for life on our jeans, uh, and we know that's going to cost us time and money because we're going to have to pull a machinist off the floor to sew the hole in your jeans. We're going to have to invest in better and better machinery. Our current machine's a 1920s Singer, and it doesn't work that well. But for us, it doesn't matter. It's one of our values to try and keep your jeans going for longer. And, you know, uh, so you maybe one blue pair, one black pair, and that's enough. You know, you don't need more than two. Um, but also other ways of education, like, you know, when you buy footwear, um, very few people know about Goodyear welted shoes, but almost every shoemaker in Northampton, you know, Cheney's, Churches, Trickers, John Lobb, etc., they use Goodyear welting, or in America, Alden, Allen Edmonds, uh, Red Wing. And if you s buy a pair of these shoes, which are going to probably cost you upwards of 200 pounds or more, you basically have a shoe that can be infinitely resold. So every time you wear it through the rubber in your shoe, you take it in, they undo the welt, put a new sole on, and you keep wearing that same pair of shoes. You don't have to buy a new pair. Um, and, you know, if you go pair, buy a pair of Nikes and you wear it through the rubber, uh, you, you throw them away, there's nothing else you can do. Um, so I think educating people, you know, learn how to darn your own jumpers. Uh, I just learned yesterday about a company called Love Cashmere in Scotland that you can, for 29 pounds, send any wool garment to them and they'll basically restore it like new. And, you know, carpet moths are a big problem in the UK. So if we can educate people that for a small price, you can save your favorite jumper and not throw it away, um, that, that's really powerful. And, and really, I think the more people understand craft and the more people understand uh, how you can keep things going for longer, um, the better we'll do at fighting fast fashion. And I think the, the forerunners in this space or the people who've made that most commercially viable is uh, Patagonia in the States. Um, Patagonia will basically fix anything for free that you've bought from them. And they've even gotten into the business of buying back old Patagonia garments, retouching them and offering them secondhand on their website. So you don't have to go buy a new rain shell or fleece. You can buy some ones from the 80s that has been given a bit of love and, and can still be worn. Uh, and similarly, uh, Filson in Seattle, which makes luggage and, and outdoor apparel, they've begun um, buying back themselves old Filson pieces restoring them, darning them, repairing them, and, and reselling them. So, uh, you know, people who want a really cool beat up Filson tote bag or like a really cozy fleece, don't have to go buy a brand new one. You can just buy one uh, second hand. And um, one last thing that might, maybe is less eco-conscious, but I know APC has a program called Butler where you can basically bring back an old pair of jeans to them. They'll give you half off your new pair and then they'll redo up your old ones and resell them. So someone else who wants vintage jeans 
can buy some that maybe someone made vintage as opposed to a guy in a factory dipping it in bleach, scrubbing it with sandpaper, and exposing himself to horrible chemicals. So it's just one more way in which all these brands are uh, trying to, to fight fast fashion and, and seasonality and, and throwing things away. Yeah, some of you might be um, familiar with Fashion Revolution um, as well, which is an organization which is really leading the way in educating consumers about these issues. Um, they have a Fashion Revolution Week every April, um, which marks the anniversary of the Rana Plaza disaster. Um, they, since, since starting in 2014, they're now in like over 90 countries worldwide. Um, they're working with brands, they're working in schools. Um, as someone who teaches 20 year olds, I actually feel really positive <laughs> um, about the next generation and that they care. Um, they're way more environmentally conscious um, than uh, you know, we ever were when we came. Um, when we had money to spend on these sorts of things. Um, and I think just once you know about it, once you educate yourself a bit, um, you know, I, I know for me now, like, you know, I, I used, shamefully, I used to be a massive shopaholic. Um, <laughs> and now, like, I walk into a high street store and it just feels bitter to me. And I get so excited when I hear about, you know, brands like yours, and to me, that means something. Like, as someone who works in the fashion industry, it makes me really, um, upset that like when did loving fashion mean not loving clothes um, like literally just buying them and like 30 percent of our wardrobes we haven't worn in a year um and things like that and i just thank god that's we need to bring bring back the love <laughs> any other questions yeah down here <laughs> so I, I, I love what all of you are doing. It, it, it's, it's amazing. Um, but how how is the fashion industry actually going to fix itself when we've got um, things like food banks and, and child poverty around the country? And uh, I, I would love everybody to go out and buy a 270 pound pair of jeans um, because they would last them for all of their lives and all of that, and then spend 300 pound on a pair of shoes. But when you can't afford to pay food for your for your house or your family. That, how is fashion going to fix itself? Well, we have plenty of clothes to go around, everybody. <laughs> I personally am a massive vintage fan, and I love secondhand, and I think, um, I think buying cheap is a false economy. Um, I think, you know, essentially, you know, you buy something cheap because, like, sure, yeah, not everybody can afford it. I really appreciate that. Um, and, but you're going to end up with a hole in it or, you know, a stain in it that you can't fix or... Um, you know, it's going to become stretched and discolored or whatever because it's bad quality. Um, so, um, but I, I think there are ways to, um, to hold into your clothes for longer or make them last, teach yourself to fix things um, and things like that that actually can be a really affordable way to do it. I don't know what you guys think about. I, th I think there's also, uh, I'm also an employer, okay? I'm a living wage employer. You can pay legally an apprentice in the UK two pounds sixty an hour. I pay our apprentices a living wage. And if we are going to be able to have this world where actually all things are made to account for their externalities, we are going to have to pay people higher wages. And that means that we can't have the inequality that we have because you can't have a business owner that just keeps the profit for themselves or distributes it to the shareholders. Yeah, I mean, as an extension on that, I think um, it's like, I, I totally understand your point about people who, who are on food banks and they need to still have an option of somewhere to buy cheaply and, and you know, clothes that they can they can wear and, and wear with pride. Um, the problem is someone is always taking a hit somewhere. So just because they can find those cheap products, it doesn't mean that, you know, then you're looking at the questionable labor practices of how those products were made. And so it's effectively the people in, in this case, in the extreme version, Bangladesh and Rana Plaza who are taking a hit. So someone takes the hit somewhere and there is no kind of <laughs> silver bullet that will effectively put an end to all of these problems. But, um, but I think you're dead right. I think paying people properly so that there is a bigger, <laughs> uh, a more 
quality to begin with in terms of people with the right disposable income to be spending in the right ways has got to be a, a step in the right direction. So it's companies have, have, have definitely got a um, you know, responsibility to do that and try to lift that base so that, um, so that basically people can afford um, better, better standards of living and better things to buy, basically. Yeah, I guess uh, I don't think there's any easy answers about how this problem solved, but I think this might be a space that's open for disruption. Um, if I think t more on a tech slant around mobile phones, I know there was a, a, a nonprofit back in the States um, maybe five, ten years ago, probably more than that actually, maybe 10, 15 years ago, who began taking older mobile phones that were not the latest tech and giving those to uh, battered women who needed a means to, to have extra security and kind of instead of throwing those phones into landfill, they, they found a way to get them in the hands of those who could leverage them. So maybe there's uh, an opportunity here for someone uh, who wants to disrupt this space to say, you know, the, the upper percentages that can afford to invest in things that last, great, keep doing so, um, hang on to your things longer, but for the other 90%, um, let's find a way to take all of this fast fashion waste and redistribute it to those in need, and you know, maybe there's something kind of like um, a step beyond Goodwill and Salvation Army and Oxfam that's actually collecting these throwaway garments and getting them into the hands of people who could still wear them. Um, because you know, because it's not fashionable doesn't mean it won't keep someone warm or dry or or comfortable if they're living on the streets or living in, in, in lower income households. So I feel like this is this is a, a, a space for disruption. And I, I think the, the fast fashion brands that are working, um, you know, with factories in Bangladesh and India and these other places, they have a responsibility to go in there and make sure that those workers are being treated properly. Because actually it doesn't cost a lot more to give those uh, workers a decent living wage. Actually, a lot of people estimate that, you know, if you just add 1%, onto the price of a garment and you gave that directly to the garment workers, they would have a living wage. It's just because of employment laws in countries, it's because of factory owners that are also uh, working in government who don't want to change these things. Um, you know, but I think we have to take responsibility um, as, as companies in the West working with these people and giving these people money to say, I don't want to work with a company, you have to abide by our code of conduct, we will come and or there's whole issues around auditing, it's another, another thing, but you know, we're gonna come check, and, and I do know of ethical fashion brands who are working with factories in places like India and Bangladesh, um, and they know the factory owners, and they ensure there's, and they still cost 20, 30 pounds for a T-shirt. Like, that, it doesn't have to be expensive. Well, yeah. Probably, we've just got time for maybe two more questions, well, well, and then okay. we're gonna have to move on. Okay, so in tech, there's a common pattern that we do where we take a thing that you might own and you provide it as a service. And like, if you forgive the jargon, like having a product service system is thing people often do. Like a Fairphone with electronics, they now basically let you rent a handset, uh, so the incentives are aligned for them to get it back, right? Are there any companies doing anything like a product service system, a bit like Rent the Runway, but for entirely ethical brands? Because this seems like an incentive problem, and I, I haven't seen anything like that, but maybe you have. This is, this is, so uh, this is a question then to the audience here, because uh, Elvis doesn't believe me. Uh, in our relationship, I am yes, he is no, okay? But I am betting that there's probably a lot of people in this room that don't even want to buy a belt from me, but you'd be more than happy to have a membership in a belt that I retained ownership of the raw material and ensured had a good life. And how many people would do that? So... Uh, I, you know, get in touch with me. I'll, I'll, put, I'll give you my email address and we'll set up a membership club for belts and we'll have it done within two weeks because, you know, we, we have the capacity to do that. It's just a fear that people might not take it up. So if, if people here are actually saying that you will do it, I think we can, we, that's something that we could, uh, that's a, a change we can make overnight. Well, I'll be joining the belt club as well then. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think it's an extension of sharing economy. Absolutely. I think people's mindsets are changing now. It's not a big thing to be using a communal bike or to be using a communal car. And why not communal clothes and communal accessories? I know it's working with the more luxury end of the fashion market so far. You know, I've heard it in, even in watches. Um, you know, there's a company in the US which I think is doing quite well. You can sort of rent the, the watches for the night. 
why not? Why, why can't we see it trickle down into everyday fashion and then start to work? I think as long as people start to, you know, are able to take care on it, I would say take care of the products. It needs to be probably on a higher base, you know, a slightly more quality product to begin with. But, but yeah, I think it's a great thing, without a doubt. I don't have any answers about who's doing that today. I mean, I've heard about renting child's toy, uh, children's toys, renting wedding dresses, renting clothes, and I think there's some kind of uh, meme on YouTube about like gifting your friends clothing you already own and them like sharing their closets uh, that's kind of catching on. Um, but it's, it's interesting because it's going to require changing the hearts and minds of the fashion industry. Just like, you know, people don't want to give up oil because the oil company is kind of making people think that solar won't work, that wind won't work, etc. Someone will have to find a way to, to build this idea of a sharing fashion economy such that hopefully the big fashion industry just crumbles and we don't even need it anymore. Um, I mean, it's a bit utopian, but I feel like with the right people thinking about it, this, this seems like a possibility and maybe even an inevitability. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, um, Olivia, uh, Cressy, Ollie, and David, thank you so much for your insights today. We definitely got a different perspective. Oh, thank you.